Uh, the next guest on the Mark Thompson show we know and love and are so, so lucky to have. David Katz, former federal prosecutor, now a defense attorney. And every time I see another Trump headline pop up, like today, during the break, just looking up, what's the latest with the Trump trial, right? Um, I'm thinking, I got to hear what David Katz has to say about this. David Katz, everybody. Hello. Hi, great to be with you guys. Oh, you're in a different Welcome. spot today. You're not in your office. I am. I'm in New York City. Oh, wow. Are you doing big interviews? Or are you going to go into the Trump trial? What are you up to? I've actually been uh, on camera uh, and in studios. It's been really interesting. I mean, so much is going on, and it's fun to be here in New York City, where I'm from originally, although I'm a California lawyer. And as you know, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Here's a, a quick uh, California lawyer joke for you. Um, why does New Jersey have the most toxic waste dumps and California have the most lawyers? I give up. New Jersey had first choice. Hey, <laughs> a little lawyer humor. Um, Let's start this conversation with the headline on CNN today that the Supreme Court appears ready to reject Trump's claims of sweeping immunity. Is it too soon to say that? Or does that what the indications are, are to you? Well, my take from the hearing today, and I listened to uh, a lot of it, um, and it was fascinating for people. Um, they should definitely try to, uh, to hear it if they can. Um, but the um, Supreme Court, uh, with three justices you know, picked by Trump and uh, three other Republicans on it, um, just seems to be doing what is in Trump's best interest. People can draw their own conclusions, but it, they're not going to find absolute presidential immunity. And everybody said that. You know, the joke on that, not as funny as yours, but the joke <laughs> on that was if that really were so, you know, Biden could go up to, to Trump, you know, and say, congratulations on your victory and then shoot him. Um, yeah. And then he'd have presidential immunity. So that horrible has been pretty much rejected by everybody that you could commit an out and out crime, that you could, as Trump said, shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then remember the Department of Justice opinion that says, and it's just an opinion, but Mueller felt bound by it, that you cannot indict a sitting president. Well, the answer to that was, and in fact, uh, McConnell said this in the Senate um, in rejecting the attempt to uh, find him guilty in the Senate, uh, not uh, guilty of a crime, but guilty in the impeachment sense and remove him from office. And people said, well, he's already been removed from office because he lost the election. But the impact of that, Kim, would have been a disqualification under the Constitution for Trump to run again. I'm getting a bit sidetracked, but everyone should remember that none of the convictions in any of these cases um, would bar Trump from running for office, nor bar him from serving again as president. That disqualification by the Senate would have, and one of McConnell's arguments, um, and the Republicans who voted against impeaching in the Senate uh, was that uh, convicting in the Senate of impeachment, in the impeachment sense, was that, well, he can always be tried in the courts. Um, so I think the decision today, Kim, is going to be that he um, has to go back. He doesn't have absolute presidential immunity. Uh, but he has to go back to the district court and have her, Judge Chutkin there, decide what are the parameters of this presidential immunity. And unless the U.S. Supreme Court decision today says you don't have an interlocutory appeal of that issue, what's going to happen, I predict, is that Judge Chutkin will say these things alleged against Trump were official act, were not official acts. These were things that were not in the course and scope of his duty. He was not, in fact, making sure that the election was faithfully executed and he just happened to be one of the contestants in it. What he was doing was beyond the course and scope. And then guess what? He'll say, no, it was covered by presidential immunity. Everything that I did that she said was not covered by presidential immunity. And guess what? He'll have another interlocutory appeal mm -hmm. to the U.S. Supreme Court or at least to some higher court. The result being that the country is about to be frustrated in its desire to see Trump stand trial uh, in Chutkin's court sometime before the election. If I'm wrong on that, and they, I, I will not be wrong on them saying there's no absolute presidential immunity. They will say there's no absolute presidential immunity. If they go on to say, okay, let's have the trial happen, I think Chutkin could fit the trial in. It would probably start in late summer, early fall, 
but I just don't see that happening. Let me add one more thing. There's a rule that some of your viewers may know that the Department of Justice does not bring charges that could affect the election within 60 days of the election. That was one of the criticisms of um, the FBI director, remember Comey. When Comey started all this ruckus over Hillary Clinton, he's a Department of Justice official. That was within 60 days of the election. But Merrick Garland, I think the Department of Justice has either indicated or all the commentators are pretty much in agreement that that 60 day rule would not apply. That would not block the Chutkin trial because Trump asked for these delays and that they ended up resulting in a trial going forward during the 60 days up until the election would not bar that trial from going forward. I'm reading on CNN that the Supreme Court is signaling, as you say, Trump's January 6th trial could be delayed until after the election. Is is that specifically because of all those appeals on what constitutes presidential immunity and whether or not it qualified that, that it could be delayed? Normally, there's something called the final judgment rule, which means you have to take all of your lumps when you're a criminal defendant. And after you're sentenced, you file one appeal in which you complain about the pretrial rulings, you complain about the things that happened at your trial, you complain about your sentencing. There are very, very few exceptions. One of them is double jeopardy, and one is this presidential immunity, which you have to be a former president to assert. Mm -hmm. So to say it doesn't come up often is an understatement. But in those, you're entitled to an interlocutory appeal. All that means is that you don't have to take all your lumps that there are certain decisions that you're allowed to appeal immediately. And guess what? That stays your trial because you argue, I have a right yeah. in this unusual circumstance not to stand trial. And so I need the remedy of an appeal and a ruling in my favor before I'm required to stand trial. The guy who says he's going to be subjected to double jeopardy says I am entitled to not have the jeopardy of a second trial. And the president keeps saying that. And my point, Kim, is that He'll be allowed unless the Supreme Court remedies this in its decision. And I didn't see really a, much of a strong indication that they were going to. It goes back to Chutkin. Whatever Chutkin decides, Trump will say, I have presidential immunity as to that. She's wrong, and I have a right not to be subject to. Oh, no, I think trial because what she just said oh, is okay. presidential immunity. Well, it is within the limited presidential immunity. And so he'll have, you know, we'll be seeing this appeal go forward either to the appeals courts, the D.C. Circuit or to the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll be seeing it six months, a year from now, and the trial will be stayed. Of course, we all know yeah. that if he becomes the president again, he'll order the Department of Justice just not to pursue the case any further. And if not, well, yes, he'll have a trial, but it'll be it'll be sometime in the future when I think he has an incentive to try to get all of this behind him once he's not a viable presidential candidate anymore. I'm co-hosting with Hal Rudnick today. So, Hal, I want you to know anytime you want to jump in and ask a question, feel free to do it. Absolutely. I'll, 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 uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take the ball. And David, you'd mentioned earlier talking about uh, Robert Mueller and the Mueller report. Um, I, I just wouldn't mind rewinding and getting your opinion on that. Uh, do you think uh, Mueller was remiss not being more emphatic about uh, Trump's wrongdoing and kind of leaving it up to the reader of the report? Do you think he should have offered up an, um, a stronger opinion there? Uh, I do. When he just uh, deferred on that, I don't know if he trusted the good faith of Bill Barr because they'd been old friends or something like that. But in my opinion, Bill Barr did not act in good faith. And when, um, you know, uh, Mueller kind of just threw that whole question of the obstructions of justice by giving 11 examples of what would appear to be prosecutable obstructions of justice, he just kind of threw it up as a jump ball. Uh, and uh, Barr jumped right on it in the next three days or so and said there's no obstruction. And that allowed Trump to run around and say no collusion, no obstruction. Right. And uh, that mm -hmm. became kind of his mantra. And people sort of uh, came to accept it by the constant repetition of it in the conservative media and by Trump. And then the, you know, the, the other media reporting it because it was happening. And then by the time the report came out, and in my opinion, had damning evidence of various different obstructions of justice. You know, one of the gr great ones, Hal, was that he had told this official uh, to say something had happened and then the official wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do Trump's bidding. And mm -hmm. then Trump said, OK, well, I guess I won't fire you after all, but claim that I never told you to cover it up. And remember, that whole thing was laid out there. That was one of the, you know, it's kind of ancient history by now. But since yeah. you asked about Mueller, it was very important. And at that time, Hal, 
I was doing a lot of commentary for CNN and uh, I was the legal expert, you know, the DOJ official and Mueller right. being himself a former DOJ official mm -hmm. when he when he handled it as mal adroitly as I think he did. It was like, what's wrong with you DOJ guys? It's like, I can't take the blame. I can't take the blame or the credit for anything that anybody from the DOJ has done. But it was it was just so disappointing to people because the report seemed to be so righteous and have so much evidence, including remember this whole thing about was it collusion, conspiracy and all the people were running to the dictionary and collusions not in the federal code. It was pretty clear that there was a showing of conspiracy, but all of it fell apart uh, because Mueller was a Department of Justice official. He was not an independent counsel like Starr was. And so he ended up. Uh, just saying that I'm bound by this opinion that a sitting president can't be indicted. Um, and so then it went, as I mentioned before, the House did uh, impeach him. But then at the Senate trial, you'll remember a few weeks after Trump actually you know, got voted out and left, um, they sort of acted like, well, what's the big deal? And on top of that, he could always face criminal charges on account of this. And so that second impeachment did not result in a... Um, ruling, which would have come right after finding him guilty of the impeachment in the Senate. Now, he says, well, that's double jeopardy. That's ridiculous, because I want to always emphasize that nothing about impeachment was criminal. So there's no double jeopardy on criminal charges. But had they uh, had 67 of the senators, had two thirds of the senators said that this is valid, these impeachment charges and convicted him, then they would have under the Constitution had to go on to the, a clause that talks about disqualifying someone who's been impeached in conviction by the Senate. And that disqualification, no doubt about it, would have barred him from running or serving. But none of these four mm -hmm. cases and none of the civil cases, of course, bar him from running and serving. Yeah, I appreciate Let's, you being able to rewind that for us. And, you know, it just emphasizes the fact that, I don't know, in, in one person's opinion, this guy stinks. I mean, Trump mm -hmm. is uh, just one after another. So I appreciate you walking us down memory lane with that, David. Thank you. Let's jump to the Trump trial underway right now. I don't know, you probably heard this. How On Tuesday, the judge told one of the Trump attorneys he's in danger of losing credibility. How damaging is that for a, a, a lawyer? I, I don't think it happened in front of the jury, but still, that's pretty big. Uh, that is a big deal. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to be kind of wary, you know, I'm always trying to argue the rule of law. I'm always trying to think, what if the shoe were on the other foot? Uh, in fact, I was on a conservative, uh, one of the large conservative uh, nationwide um, stations uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, the other guest was sort of reveling in the fact that, well, wait until Trump gets back into power. Watch all of these states uh, mm -hmm. do to Biden exactly what the New York DA is doing to um uh, uh, doing to Trump. You know, I think they're very distinguishable situations. I think this is something Mark was always sensitive to. And I think you were too, Kim, when we talked about the Colorado decision, that what goes around comes around and that while Colorado might bar Trump from the ballot, uh, what about in some swing state uh, that had sort of uh, Republicans that might do it, but was purple and they had kept Biden off the ballot in some big swing state. I guess Wisconsin maybe was one of those that came to mind. So I, I'm aware of the point that this um, you know, right wing commentator was making. But I do think that, you know, we, we do trust in the jury system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's some reason to think that, you know, we'll wait and see what the jury does. Uh, the things that are troubling to me, do you mind me ticking them off about the, no, the New York case? please bring it. Well, one is that it looks like the statute of limitations has run on the misdemeanor. So if they only find him guilty of the misdemeanor, uh, they will have, I think they'll have to uh, nullify that verdict, right? Because it's wrong under the law. The jury will have only found him guilty of the one that is time barred. They need to have the misdemeanor stick around the falsification of documents because there's a way to bump it up to a felony. So the DA in New York is kind of betting everything that the jury will come back unanimously um, on the um, bumped up felony. Now, They've been a little vague about what that bumped up felony would be. And so as a criminal defense attorney now, I don't like that. We bring things called a bill of particulars because we say, look, if the indictment's not clear and the discovery is not very clear as to exactly what the government's theory is, we have a right to know what to defend. That's the whole idea of <clears throat> innocent until proven guilty. That's our rule of law. That's the presumption of innocence. Tell me exactly what you're being charged with 
so that I can defend it. That seems like the rule of law. That seems like fairness. People have speculated, and they shouldn't have to speculate, but they've speculated, what is this felony that's unlawful? One theory is that Trump knew he was violating federal campaign law. If they can prove that Trump knew beyond a reasonable doubt that he was violating campaign uh, finance law, this is not an argument for the jury, but it's an argument in the court of public opinion, then why did the federal government, not just under Barr and Trump, but why did the federal government under Merrick Garland and the Biden picked U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, why did they not charge this as a federal crime? Now, there's lots of prudential reasons. They could have decided that they weren't going to do that. They could have said, you know, if Trump isn't indicted and convicted of everything on January 6th, because they had that in the rearview mirror when they were making the decision in 2017 whether to indict Trump or not for this. But when you hear these revelations come out, like what Pecker is testifying to about the conspiracy that was all laid out, when you hear about how Alan Weisselberg, who was the CFO, when you hear about how he um, apparently wrote down exactly, you know, we're going to commit the conspiracy this way. We always argued as prosecutors, don't expect to see a written roadmap of the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Weisselberg made out a written roadmap <laughs> of the conspiracy. But the federal government knew all of that. They knew all of that, and they declined to proceed on these charges. So that gives, of course, a lot of room in the court of public opinion for Trump to keep saying, you know, uh, Edwards was indicted for something like this and I wasn't. You know, even Biden's Justice Department didn't indict me for this. This is the political DA, you know, with its 87 percent of the people in Manhattan voted for Biden, 13 percent for Trump. It plays into that argument. And the other thing is that they're going to try to prove that Trump knew that it was a violation of state um, campaign finance law. I assume that when he said to Michael Cohn, let's pay cash, he had all those interchanges with Michael Cohn, that Michael Cohn is going to testify. I told him, you're violating state campaign finance law. <laughs> you're violating federal campaign finance law. And that is one reason why the credibility of uh, Cohn uh, probably will be important, because he's going to say that he told Trump that these were violations of both kinds of felony laws and that Trump absolutely knew it. And of course, if the jury believes that, then they get they get over that hump really easy. Does that mean mm. Michael Cohen is a bad lawyer? Should Michael Cohen have told Trump back in the whole, you know, when we're going to pay off Stormy, listen, you got to use your own money. If you use your own money, we avoid all of this stuff. So yeah, he wasn't a, a good consigliere there. That's right. That's right. He, he, he should have known. He wanted a Roy Cohn, and all they got was Michael Cohen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't but know. There's, there's a couple of great jokes on this since I'm, I'm on with a professional comedian. I'm, <laughs> certainly, not. I'm certainly not. By the way, um, so I, I noticed the chat. They were like, oh, well, what, why are you making lawyer jokes with a, such a, you know, an esteemed lawyer? My brother's also an, a lawyer uh, for the record. So, uh, <laughs> it's I, I okay. Uh, yes. My old friend and colleague, uh, Adam Schiff from the U.S. Attorney's Office, mm. um, he wanted to be a comedian, not a lawyer. Oh, so wow. I, I'm sure Trump would have liked that a whole lot better if Adam Schiff had become a comedian, which was his his real desire in life, and, and not a, and not an attorney, and not the great prosecutor who prosecuted him in the Senate on the yes. first impeachment trial, the one involving Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, uh, and the famous uh, perfect phone call, that perfect phone call that he got impeached <laughs> for. But, um, you know, there's a couple of jokes with this. Not that I'm in competition with you because you, you're, you're, no, you're, you're always going to win the comedy prize. Um, but, uh, you know, Trump's reaction was, I finally paid one of my bills and this is what I get. <laughs> he That's pretty good. Code every month, every month from the Oval Office, from the White House, he dutifully sent that check with his signature on it to Michael Cohn. Uh, 2017, 2018, I paid one of my bills and this is what I get. And of course, the other joke is that he wishes he just paid her in cash right now, right? He'd have paid her in cash. You can pay off a porn star to keep her, um, to, to not tell her story. Um, and uh, that's not a violation uh, of the law. It's unseemly, it's immoral, the whole thing is tawdry. Um, so I'm sure he's saying to himself, and I think he's going to say, I mean, the part of it that's going to be a real defense is he's going to say, I, I just wanted to pay her cash. I just wanted her to go away. She was extorting me. You know, that's what I figured, you know, meet her in a back alley, pay her money and hope that she lives up to her promise to go away and stop blackmailing me. That's going to be his narrative. 
And that Michael Cohen said, no, I've got it all figured out. Don't pay your cash. I've got this thing all figured out. And Trump figured, well, he's a lawyer. He had it all figured out from a legal point of view and that he was just following the advice of counsel. He had an opportunity, Hal and, and Kim, to make an advice of counsel defense. But if he had wanted to say that he really did rely on the advice of Michael Cohn or any other lawyers, that would have made him have to turn over discovery. If you're going to make that as an affirmative defense, you can't hide in the, you know, hide in the bushes and spring it on the prosecution at the last minute. You've got to give them a fair chance at the discovery on it. So what it means is you've got to turn over all the records. That was the last thing that Trump wanted to do was yeah. to turn over all the records. Because this was not like a normal like corporation that relies on advice of counsel. They say we're going to have this discharge of you know uh, in some environmental thing. Give us your opinion. How should we discharge? How should we discharge it? What should we do? What abatement should we do? And they tell all the facts to the lawyer, and the lawyer comes up with a plan, and then they end up getting charged with an environmental violation. And they say, well, wait a second, I just relied on advice of counsel. Everything that the client told the lawyer, everything the lawyer said back, all of that becomes discoverable. There's no attorney-client privilege anymore because your defense is that in good faith, I told the lawyer everything, and here's what the lawyer advised me. Trump didn't want to go that way. Yeah. He wants to just say, well, there were lots of lawyers around, you know, kind of like <laughs> you're crossing at a red light at, at the bar convention, and you see two or three lawyers crossing on the red light in front of you. So you figure, well, I'm not a lawyer, but they must know the law. They're crossing at the red light. You know, the idea that lawyers are around violating the law doesn't mean that you're right in doing it. If you want to make an advice of counsel defense, you got to make one. You got to turn over the discovery. Trump didn't want to go that route. Can I mention one other thing, too, because I'll Please. forget it otherwise. Yeah. This whole presidential immunity that just got argued in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court, Trump could have argued to the judge in New York City. Um, he could have argued months ago, hey, I shouldn't be prosecuted in this case at all. This Stormy Daniels hush money. Uh, election interference case in New York City. I shouldn't be prosecuting this at all because I have presidential immunity. This was within my official acts. In fact, I wrote those checks in the White House. That was something I did as president. Yes, this was during the campaign, but some of it was while I was president. He didn't make that motion until the last minute. So the judge said, don't play me. Your lawyers know knew this issue was out there. You argued it in the district court, the appellate court, in the U.S. Supreme Court. You didn't argue it to me until a couple of weeks before trial. No, there was a motion schedule. You didn't file your motion on time. So when you hear Trump say some of these preposterous things that he said, like, well, why is my presidential immunity being recognized <laughs> in the New York City trial? You didn't make the motion. When he says, how come I didn't have a jury trial with regard to that case where he got fined $500 million? I said $500 million. He didn't ask for a jury trial in that case. So that's why. Where was the jury? The jury wasn't there because you and your lawyers didn't ask for one, Donald. So in the Trump trial, I love your Trump voice, by the way. In the <laughs> Trump, in the Trump trial right now, in the uh, the hush money case, I guess today the David Pecker, the National Enquirer boss, is is questioned about Stormy Daniels. So Stormy Daniels will probably take the stand at some point. Karen McDougal, another Playboy playmate person that apparently Trump had an affair with and paid off will be taking the the stand at some point. I've been thinking about who the Trump team could get to testify in the defense in this. And who do you put? I mean, as a defense attorney yourself, who do you who, who do you put on the stand in this particular case? Well, if <clears throat> if it was somebody other than Trump, you know, I could imagine myself being the defense attorney in a case like this because it, you know, it, it, it's white collar. Uh, you know, the fact that he was trying to hush up the president. I mean, imagine if it were a senator or a Congress member or something like that. They find themselves in the same boat. Edwards found himself in this boat uh, when mm -hmm. after he ran for president. You'll remember, of course, uh, the scandal there. Um, but that, you know, he misstated uh, what the money was going for. It was to pay hush money uh, to I don't want to get this wrong, but uh, I think that you know, he had a mistress, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and he had a child and he wanted somebody else to say that. And so he paid all this money and he didn't disclose properly what it was really being uh, paid for. He got prosecuted by the federal government on these campaign charges that are very much like the federal equivalent of what the New York City DA's case is like. He had a hung jury and then the Department of Justice figured not to retry that case. 
I don't know if we're going to talk about Weinstein at all, but your audience has to remember that these cases that are either hung juries or that get reversed on appeal, generally speaking, they go back for a retrial, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. If you're if you're like Harvey Weinstein serving a long prison sentence, you'd yeah. rather have a new trial than no action at all. And you just serve out your term in prison. So a new trial, right. of course, is a victory for the defendant. But it doesn't mean that justice is undone in some ways. It just means that you're going to have a new trial and whatever error was made at the old trial that was not harmless, that affected the verdict. They're going to not make that error at the new trial, and you're going to throw the dice again um, and uh, let the chips fall where they may, which I think in Harvey Weinstein's case would be that he's going to be found guilty again in New York, in my opinion. Um, and uh, But apparently in Edwards's case, they rethought about it and they decided not to pursue those cases. I I've had hung juries, uh, and that is normal that, especially if it's hung the defense's way, I don't know that Edwards's was, Kim, mm -hmm. but if it's hung, the, you know, I had one that was... Uh, only uh, three people voted to convict. That's a case that the uh, that's the case that the government you know offer you something like probation or some kind of disposition mm -hmm. that your client would live with um, if they don't drop it all together. Uh, David, oh yeah, no, go ahead. Pal. About, yeah, I was thinking about uh, the uh, Arizona uh, election interference charges, and um, can you elaborate a little bit more on why Giuliani and Mark Meadows? were uh, were charged there and not Trump? Well, I had actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I had suggested this with the Georgia case, that they should have started a lot earlier. And I think Arizona should have started a lot earlier. I don't know all the whys and wherefores, but I know that the election interference happened almost four years ago by now. And so you do have to ask yourself, you know, as a fair-minded person, why did it take Georgia that long? And certainly why did it take Arizona this long? Uh, it might be that there's a new attorney general and the old attorney general wasn't interested. And I certainly get that. Um, but one of the ideas in these cases, Hal, is to go with a low, like you do in a normal conspiracy. You don't charge like, you know, Gotti or Trump right at the outset. You charge some underlings, some people that you think will flip. And then you have them, uh, you know, turn as state's evidence, as we call it. Um, they become cooperators. Uh, against the higher up person that you want to get. So you get the capos and the capos realize that they're facing prison and that their only alternative is, you know, to get a lower sentence. I, I love this whole analogy that you're going with, by the way. And I love that you use Gotti and Trump in the same sentence. Please continue. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I, people, I, I hope that that's not in people's minds a false equivalency, but it is, you know, it's charged as racketeering in Atlanta. Sure. I think yes. they sort of use that as a model. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm using because they go from the capo to the head of and, and they charge a racketeering conspiracy, which mm -hmm. Kim will, 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 will Kim knows and the viewers know that I am uh, I criticize that racketeering thing, especially for smaller players, because the smaller players have to sit through a racketeering trial. Right. And hire a lawyer um, for a week of testimony against them. But they have to sit through and hire a lawyer for months of trial on the racketeering charges. I think for the smaller fish, that's really bad. But turning to the Arizona case, they've charged Meadows. They've charged Giuliani. Uh, they charged a fellow named Boris Epstein, who I don't think has been charged anywhere else. Um, they've also charged some people who I have to imagine are cooperating with them, like Jenna Ellis, because we all saw her tearful uh, apologia, right, and everything <laughs> else. And she, uh, uh, and she presumably is cooperating with them. It's also been reported that Ken... Cheeseboro. Now they're making me struggle with this guy's pronunciation again because half the people <laughs> say Cheeseboro, and I think the correct pronunciation is Chesbro. Right. Um, but he's the the uh, attorney from um, um, Wisconsin, who was actually a very reputable attorney and worked, I think, with his Harvard Law School professor on the Bush Gore thing, and he really knew something about these issues. And I think he ended up making a deal in this case. I noticed that he was not charged in Arizona. But the Arizona case, Hal, is going to be a lot like the Georgia case. Basically, they're going to, except without Trump in it. And I think their thought is that, look, it's not pardonable because it's in state court. Even if Trump becomes the president again, he can't pardon uh, you know, the, the people in this case. They will get those people, like in a normal case, convicted. They will get them to turn. Trump and his lawyers will argue, of course, you would have told on you know, St. Peter 
if it would have been uh, something to get you a sentence reduction. That's what these people do. They invent stuff. They make stuff up. This is their get out of jail free card. Blame Trump. They'll argue all that. But the reality is you get someone like Meadows to describe day by day. You remember Chrissy. What's her last name? Um, Chrissy from she was the aide to Meadows. She described the yeah. things like in the car, uh, Trump trying to grab the wheel. Uh, the fact that he knew that people had machine or had guns, not machines, I'm sorry, they had guns that wouldn't have got them through the magnetometer. So he said at the rally at the ellipse right before the January 6th insurrection, he said, well, don't check them. They're my people. Yeah. She had all of that inside stuff. Can you imagine what Meadows yeah. have? So they could say all day long, Trump's lawyers at the trial of Trump with Meadows mm -hmm. cooperating in Arizona. And recounting all that kind of stuff, they could say, well, Meadows just wants his get out of jail free card. But there it is. And the jurors would say, no, I, I believe this. I don't believe he's just making this up. And then they would corroborate him. And, you know, at some point, Giuliani, Giuliani gets it. Giuliani doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison. So Giuliani might very well turn. Uh, that's what mm -hmm. happens to people under this intense, incredible pressure. I've seen it both as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney. And I've seen the arguments on both sides, but you get the person, if they're credible to the jury, you prepare them. And that doesn't mean you coach them. You prepare them where you ask them questions like you think the defense attorney will ask them. And you get those people so that they just, you know, uh, does that make sense? Oh, really? You have, oh, you have a document that supports that? Where do we go find that document? You go subpoena the document that corroborates your witness, right? And uh, you do the best that you can on both sides. Um, and, you know, from the prosecutor's point of view, um, you know, and from the defense attorney's point of view. And, uh, you know, all these cases have cooperators. You look at some of the great cases in American history. They had cooperators and the jury said, you know what? On balance, I find the person guilty. I find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Uh, Cassidy Hutchins, I think, is the name you're looking Thank for. You. Yeah. Um, so let's turn really quickly because I know I'm over time on my David Katz allotment for this day. But the Supreme Court looking at this case out of Idaho re relating to abortion and emergency care. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on with that? There are apparently some states, um, this has to do with emergency health care. Mm -hmm. And so you're taken under a federal statute, um, talks about people who get taken to emergency rooms and they're entitled to get um, the best and proper treatment. So for a woman, let's say, who is um, having, um, it's not, well, she's having a, a health problem and they take her there and the doctors decide, you know, the best medical treatment for you is to have an abortion. In a state where you can only have an abortion if it's going to threaten the life of the mother, the argument goes, well, it's not threatening the life of the mother. Yes, yeah, she's having a bad pregnancy. Um, and uh, th so doctors are very worried that if they decide that this woman needs to have an abortion medically from a medical point of view, but her life is not in danger yet, as Sotomayor asked, how about if her organ is in danger? And the attorney for Idaho said, no, that's what the statute says. If her organ is in danger, that's not enough to give her that necessary medical care. And so they actually have an incentive under these laws that are so anti-choice. They actually, in, in those states, uh, to make the mother wait to make the mother wait until her life really is in danger Ugh. before they perform the abortion. So Idaho has ended up in this situation now where they're either doing that or they're airlifting. They're now airlifting like a woman a day to oh. other states so they can oh. have that emergency procedure that they need under the statute. And it's also been pointed out that those babies are, are going to be babies or, you know, that from the, you know, that, 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 that the fetuses in those cases, the embryos, are not going to make it. They're not going to become uh, children ever. But, you know, it, it, and this goes back to the whole in vitro fertilization thing, mm -hmm. that, the, you know, the true believers on anti-choice, they believe that life begins at conception. That was the problem with the IVF. And uh, they're still pushing that. Arizona got pushback from those people. They finally passed a new statute which is going to supersede that 1864 yeah. law. Right. But they got pushback from the people who actually, you know, take that, take that tack. They held the House of Arizona, the Arizona House back. Now it looks like it will be approved in the Arizona Senate. So that 1864 law, and the governor has said there in Arizona 
that she will sign the law. Um, but this is this is a, a huge problem, this Idaho case right now. I think that sanity will prevail at the Supreme Court um, and that they will say that, look, if it's medically necessary, it's medically necessary. And that that federal law does supersede uh, these very restrictive laws in states like uh, Idaho. But we're going to have to wait and see. But I, I, I'm fairly confident that sanity will prevail, even though it's been before this U.S. Supreme Court that Kat we have. Sadamas has spoken. I hope you're right, because it's so nonsensical to me to have a non-viable pregnancy anyway and then make a woman suffer. I don't know how oh, yeah, anybody could in, say that that's a good Texas idea. Texas as well, where yeah. uh, you know a woman who is carrying a stillborn child and mm -hmm. has to deliver it through yeah. birth. What just what a nightmare situation. <laughs> There's, There's Katsadamas. Absolutely. So you think even though they overturned Roe v. Wade, this particular Supreme Court will see the light in this case? Um, you know, it's it's a it's a balance, and it's uh, ironic because Alito, in his lead opinion, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade in Dobbs, said, "Oh well, this will leave it uh, up to the states." But you know, for a, a, an an issue that they were going to leave up to the states, it sure seems to be arriving in the U.S. Supreme Court a lot. Mm -hmm. But I just think that they, they don't have they don't have the votes. I think that this federal statute will be interpreted in a way that there will be a sensible resolution in those cases and that we won't have a woman losing an organ before she's near death and then she finally as you say gets an, an abortion it's a medical procedure then that the, the life of this you see the idea of the statute just to do one more second on it is that they're supposed to give the best care not just to the mother but to the unborn child mm -hmm. the statute meant in a situation where the woman is actually giving birth to what appears to be a viable baby. And they need to think about not just the mother, but also that baby that's in the process mm -hmm. of being born. They were not talking about this kind of case or looking out for the health of the embryo by making sure it got born. I think Alito asked a question like, well, isn't it catastrophic for the embryo? I, I just don't think that they're going, I think they're gonna have a decision that takes into account uh, what the statute had in mind, that there must be concern about the, uh, the, the, the baby that's actually being born, but not, but, but, but not in this kind of situation. This is just cruel with no per, it's not serving anything. Even if you believe, I think, in the sort of more, um, you know, anti-choice uh, position, I, I think that, that I, I just think the Supreme Court's not going to do something that's barbaric. That's how much optimism I have in, in them. They're not going to do something totally barbaric. I know people will write in and say what they did in Dobbs was totally right. barbaric. I'm going to take your ray of sunshine, David Katz. Thank you for Thank giving you. it to me today. I, I'll, I'll take all the positive I can get on this one. And Thank you for... Was Hal, it was great meeting you. Such a pleasure. And Kim, uh, right back you. at you. And uh, thank you for uh, just uh, uh, regaling us with so much knowledge and so much perspective. Great thank you, David Republican. Katz. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye bye. Hi, it's Mark. And I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped. And please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.